From Northeast Minneapolis, it's On Cue, the program that explores our urban environment. Phil Lindsay's guests include Rita Bloomberg from the Minnesota Historical Society, Stephen Osmond from Fort Snelling, and Ann Calvert, the maven of the Minneapolis Riverfront. Residential preservationist Bob Roscoe, Charlene Royce providing intelligence about Team 007, and Jeremy Mayberg of RSB Architects talking about the historic Grain Belt Brewery. Plus, an update from Meg Forney about the Committee on Urban Environments. It's an historic show of epic proportion on Q January 2004. Hello, and welcome to On Q, the show that talks about our urban environment. On this edition, we're going to talk about historic preservation. But before we meet our guests, let's take a little tour of this wonderful restored home in Northeast Minneapolis. Well, we want to thank the Feebiggers for letting us into their wonderful home here in Northeast Minneapolis. It's been a thrill to, to get to know the house, to get to know them, and just to be here in this. So, hope you enjoyed that little tour. My first guest is Brita Bloomberg. She's the head of the State Historical Preservation Office, and thanks for being here. You're welcome. Brita, I've certainly heard about you over the years, and in my years when I was with the City of Minneapolis, SHPO was an acronym that kept coming up in many, many important ways. But for those folks who don't know what SHPO is, <laughs> could you describe just what 
that Historic Preservation Office sure, is and does? Sure, the, the State Historic Preservation Office is actually within the Minnesota Historical Society, but there is a State Historic Preservation Office in every state in the nation. Um, the offices were really established under the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, and they have responsibility for carrying out the Historic Preservation Program in the um, state of Minnesota, but also the national program. Now, technically, does that make you an officer? You're the well, I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> fine. That's great. And now, a little bit about your background. I know um, one thing that I've always admired about you, you come out of a theater background, mm -hmm. but you also started the uh, Preservation Alliance of Minnesota. Weren't you the founder? Well, or well one I, of was, them? I was on the founding board of that okay. organization. I had actually been part of the staff of the State Historic Preservation Office prior to the founding of the um, Preservation Alliance. And the Alliance grew up, kind of came out of a t an environment when preservation was really floundering because of the loss of federal funding and state funding. And so that we saw a need for a statewide preservation organization. Sure. You've talked about the context of preservation, that it's not only a discipline. I mean, there are people trained in this, but it's become a movement as well of interested people. Could you share a little bit about that with us? You know, I think historic preservation is really about stewardship. And in fact, sitting in this home reminds me that it's about how we take care of the environment that we have, that has really kind of fallen into our hands through one, one way or another. And people that care for historic homes are, you know, part of that movement. Um, I think that's important not to um, kind of minimize how important it is to take care of the resources that we're, we're given. And historic preservation really has been going on for a very long time. The people that run businesses out of you know, Main Street buildings and take care of historic homes such as this. Um, but I think when you think about it, um, historically, the early movement of historic preservation was probably those people that saved um, a historic house here and there and really established a house museum. Um, the Sibley House, for example, here in Minnesota comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, the historic preservation movement has really grown to embrace a very wide range of resources. Um, we look not only at the historic houses of um, the people that were perhaps very influential in early settlement, for instance, but we also look at um, you know, historic bridges. We look at commercial historic districts. We look at collections of historic resources. We look at um, one of our more recent listings in, is an agricultural historic landscape down in Goodhue County, Minnesota. Um, You've even mentioned shipwrecks. That's right. Um, shipwrecks on the bottom of Lake Superior are listed now on the National Register of Historic Places, which is the um, official listing of properties in the nation deemed worthy of preservation. That must be tough to inventory that kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it is, although you start with a literature search. Oh, there you <laughs> so go. You don't start just combing sure. the, the bottom of the lake. Well, you mentioned the federal legislation, but in 1966, mm -hmm. and what's the connection with the National Register as something that kind of organizes probably this? Probably one of the most important products of that legislation was the creation of the National Register of Historic Places. And um, the National Register, I actually have a publication that's yeah, a guide. Me, yeah. um, it's a guide to all of the National Register properties in the state of Minnesota. This is newly published by the Minnesota Historical Society Press just this last year. But there are a little over 1,500 properties on the National Register in the state of Minnesota. In Minnesota alone? That's right. And they're located in every county of the state. Wow. Um, large and small, um, the very the, the the properties that you would you know immediately think of the courthouses and right. um, kind of the architectural gems in our communities, but also very common places. Um, well, as I just browse through this very quickly, it's very well laid out. It'd be a very easy resource to use. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Keep it in the car, maybe, or plan a trip. That's one of the reasons it's designed in the size that it is. Yeah. It could fit in your glove compartment. And it looks like it's county by county. Mm -hmm. That's great. Good. We have information actually on the Minnesota Historical Society website as well that has information about all of the National Register properties in the state. Is that a website you could rattle off just off the top of your head? Sure, it's um, www. Um, oh, let me see. I probably can't. Oh, that's all right. We can <laughs> put it at the end of the show. Yeah. <laughs> We've got that covered anyhow. Um, you've talked about the difference between sort of the historic side of historic preservation as well as sort of the other side of it. The Talk, preservation The side. preservation, yeah. You know, the, the historic side really encompasses what you would expect, the stories yeah. of the places. And in order yeah. to really understand um, what resources in a community um, are, you know, what makes them important, what, what is the story that they tell you, I need to understand the context, the historical context, and what, yeah. um, how these properties are all kind of woven together. And so in order to kind of address the historic side of historic preservation, we conduct cultural resource surveys, um, we inventory properties, we register them on the National Register or on local registers. Um, but on the preservation side is where you really get into the, the um, 
carrots and the sticks that it might encourage historic preservation. Um, ultimately, properties are preserved when you can find viable uses for them. Yeah. I think they're most at risk when they're vacant. Um, then they're obviously vulnerable to fire, to any number of things. You know, you, you just triggered something. I think, uh, certainly when I was younger, I would think of a historic property as something that was perhaps preserved and then programmed. You mentioned the Sibley House right. and certain others. as a museum. As a museum or something. But it's really much broader it's than that. It's much broader than that, yeah. absolutely. And the danger really is if it's something that is, is historic, people want to save it, want to do something with it, but there is no reuse viable. Right. One of the programs that um, the Preservation Office has had a lot of success with is actually a reuse study program where we look at a historic property that's perhaps threatened or in some form of some way it's in transition and we try to we gather together a team of experts that will kind of look at um, the range of possibilities and interview a great num number of people and this has been a really effective process. And then who makes use of that? Is it is it municipalities and developers? It's, kind of, it's, it's any number of Anybody? people. It's yeah. any, really it's any number of people. Okay later on this show we're going to have a guest on to talk about what his firm did with the Grain Belt Brewery here in Northeast mm -hmm. Minneapolis. And as you're saying, that was, it's a wonderful property. Well, and that, that vacant. Prop it's for a years. great example of somehow some of the kinds of incentive programs that come together for preservation. Um, mm -hmm. When that particular building was rehabilitated, um, they took advantage of the federal investment tax credits to help yes. make the economics of it work. One better. of those carrots you're talking That's about. That's right. And Could you briefly, just, I know there are other uh, incentives well, as well. The other one that yeah. I want to mention is the, the grants program. Yeah. Um, because it's on the National Register, it was eligible for grants through the Minnesota Historical Society. And in this case, the Pierre Botineau Library that's now yes. in the um, wagon shop or the mm -hmm. Wagon Works building um, received a half a million dollar grant. It was through the through state your of Minnesota. Office. It was through the state of Minnesota, yeah. the Minnesota legislature, and through our office that we administered that grant. And that was really an example, I think, of where had those resources not been available, we may not have been able right. to res preserve that building to the sure. degree that it's. And been. many partners came in. I know also exactly. Um, it's many, many partners. Right, the city and the neighborhoods and things like that. Uh, going back to um, the tax credits, just briefly, because most people probably don't understand how that works. People say, a tax credit, how does that work? What, what kind of an incentive is that? What does that allow a, someone to a, do? It's a federal investment tax credit whereby historic properties that are income producing and are listed on the National Register or are in a certified local district qualify for a 20% tax credit for qualified rehabilitations. It's, it's pretty technical. Um, right. It's a partnership really with the, um, the Preservation Office, the National mm -hmm. Park Service in administering it, and the IRS. Basically makes it more affordable right, to exactly. do something. Exactly. It's one of many things that you need in a right. toolkit to try to make a project right. work. I know, at least I assume I, I know this fact, that in the Minneapolis uh, Warehouse District, probably in the last 20, 25 years, some of those credits allowed people to go in and fix some things up that otherwise might not have or would right. go derelict or that something that. makes a like big that. difference. Yeah. And, and it, that particular incentive alone can't do it. We are always right. looking for other kinds of incentives as well. In fact, we've been working with the state legislature to try to find a way to pass a state tax credit that could you know, right. help kind of make that package of credits and um, incentives yeah. a little more attractive. Um, it's a way, in some ways, to kind of level the playing field, so sure. to make sure that historic properties have some of the kinds of um, protections and incentives that help. Well, this being a tough economic time and budgets being what they are, I mean, how likely do you th think something like that might happen these days? You know, that's a, that's a hard question yeah. to answer. You know, it's, I always say that historic preservation, um, in, in hard times, it can work on our side as well. Yeah. Um, when I look at a place like the Minneapolis Riverfront, um, I think one of the reasons that that has, you know, it's seeing today an incredible rebirth, but it really, it was those years that it languished that in some ways preserved, it bought some time. Well, that's an so interesting while those, point. So while those resources yeah. were terribly at risk during that time, right. um, had the development boom been happening much earlier, we may not have been able to save a lot of those resources. Very good point. So, uh, so it's, it's counterintuitive kind of, almost it that is. even when the money was sort of flowing, uh, it, that might have led to, from your point of view, certainly uh, not the it, happiest there results. Are, there are certain, you know, dangers when when the yeah. money is flowing very fast right. because there, the incentive to um, sometimes level historic resources sure. um, is greater. Um, it means that in difficult times we have to be all the more strategic and really prioritize what's in. What's is that important. also part of the role that you all play? Is is trying to put the different partners together that on these kinds of issues? That is a lot of it. A lot of the work of the Historic Preservation Office is actually behind the scenes. Um, yeah. We do not ourselves own and manage the historic resources, so we are always in the position mm. of trying to find ways to encourage and cajole and <laughs> sometimes regulate um, using any number of yeah. tools. But um, I think you know education is a really important tool as well. Yes. Um, that's 
that's one of the reasons we publish things like the book on National like Register Properties. I think as, as people are um, made aware of the value of the resources around them, they're much more likely to preserve them. And I can't think of a historic site that I've been to where there wasn't an educational program of some sort, sometimes more than one mm -hmm. program uh, involved. So We have just a moment left. Are there any current projects that are most exciting to you that maybe our viewers would like to hear about? Well, you know, actually there's a current project that's a very um, challenging project and that is in, be, largely because of the current budget situation in mm -hmm. the state. Um, there are three campuses that are right now facing closure and um, the state is in the process of um, selling property um, at Agua Ching, at um, Fergus Falls, and in Wilmer, some state hospital facilities. And these are large campuses of buildings that are on the National Register. So Right now we're working with the State Department of Administration and with local communities to try to find ways to see that those properties are preserved. Reuse study. Reuse study, yes. Best of luck on that. Those <laughs> sound important to hang on to. They're very important That's resources, good. so we would hate to see them lost. Right. Well, Brita Bloomberg, thank you for kind of an overview about what your office does and, and this whole issue of historic preservation. Thanks You're for welcome. being on the show. It's great to be here. All right. And kind of taking off from some of this conversation, our next guest will be here to talk about historic Fort Snelling and the Minneapolis Riverfront. But first, let's take a look at a little tour of some historic buildings throughout Northeast Minneapolis. We'll be right back. Schuel's Grocery, which has been here since 1914. And uh, my grandmother and her husband started it. And then my uh, parents ran it. And now uh, me and my two brothers are running it. Uh, my grandfather was born in Italy, however, um, immigrated to um, Spooner, Wisconsin, and met my grandmother in Cumberland, which is 20 miles away. They married and moved here and opened the grocery store. Now my grandmother was really the hard worker of the family. My grandfather went and worked at an ice cream factory and she ran the store. Um, throughout the years, the store has had gas pumps in front of it when it first opened, kind of like a Super America, I think they stole the idea from us. And then um, at one point she had a soda fountain along the back over here. She even had a little restaurant set up in the corner where she used to wait on tables and she was a hairdresser. Oh, we've made changes as years go on. Uh... We put in movies. We made it more of a self-service. You know, we used to cut meats and all all that type of thing, which we don't anymore. And everything's packaged, so it's pretty much self-service. In the very beginning, of course, things were not packaged. Everything was in crate barrels, and you'd have bulk flour and bulk eggs and so forth. Well, then um, my grandmother added a, a meat counter, and she was also a butcher. We have a big thick butcher block there and she made her own sausage which my brothers still make today same recipe only it's actually better these shelves were custom made and they were made by an Italian um, Italian uh, relative and they're all handmade they're all solid wood and about once every 10 years my brothers clean them up and varnish them and keep them intact my fondest memory is of my grandmother um, disciplining all the kids in the neighborhood when they come in. I mean, they would, she would point her finger at them and tell them they were no good, but they loved her. And um, kids trying to steal candy and she'd catch them and everybody called her Nani. Uh, my grandmother also owned a lot of property on the block, so she had rents coming in. And um, she liked to, to gamble with some of the customers. She, she use a, there's a dice game that you can, it's called Double or Nothing, and she used to, I have the, the cup, she'd shake the, with the customers for their bill, and they'd either pay double or nothing on their bill. That's great. 
And we're back, and I want to say how fun it is just to take a look at some of those historic properties and sites in northeast Minneapolis. There's a nice little package there. Later on in the show, Bob Roscoe talking about residential preservation and someone who was very involved with getting the Grain Belt Brewery up and reused. But first, I've got two guests. I'm very excited to introduce them to you. Ann Calvert is with the uh, Community Planning and Economic Development Department of the City of Minneapolis. I call her the maven of the Minneapolis Riverfront. <laughs> Nice to have you back on the show, Ann. Mm -hmm. And Good Stephen Osmond, who is the site manager for historic Fort Snelling. Hi, and I'm excited to have you here. We haven't actually met before. Um, historic Fort Snelling, um, just in case anybody in the metropolitan area doesn't know where it is, could you just orient us to where you work? We are right in the center of everything. We're a mile east of the airport, uh, right at the junction of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. Very strategic spot, was then, still is now. Everyone who comes to Minnesota by air, comes right by Fort Snelling. And the fact of the matter is that confluence is why, and, and the bluffs of that com, over that confluence That's is why the they built the fort. You have to remember that 175 years ago, there were really no roads up here. And the only way that you could get goods into this area was on the river. That was a transportation highway. So it was very important to keep a watch on those rivers and to have a fort there. And you're the site manager. I'm the site manager. What does that mean? Well, it means that a lot of things land on my desk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we hire quite a number of people. Uh, in the early spring to dress up in costume and act as tour guides at the fort. Uh, we have about 25 buildings we're responsible for, 50 acres of land, uh, costumes, uh, props, gift shops, uh, lots of different things. Well, you mentioned costumes, and I guess we could There's even call them. Well, let's just grab them right now. Well, can you imagine <laughs> soldiers being sent up here 175 years ago wearing a cap like this. This is the ugliest cap ever issued to the U.S. Army. The only good thing about it, you could fold it up and pack it away. Yeah. And it looks to me like it would be hot. Very on those hot, hot summer, steamy summer days, very hot. heat would build up in there. Well, as ugly as that may be, um, <laughs> this is very interesting to me. How would well, you describe this, that's, Steve? That's the dress cap that they wore in the 1820s. And again, made out of leather, varnished, highly polished, very impressive, but not very comfortable. And I would think, I don't mean to be facetious, but this would fall off, wouldn't it? Uh, How does that balance on the old noggin? And forth. I'm sure when the Dakota Indians saw these, they said, what are those people thinking, giving <laughs> their soldiers caps like that? Yeah, and I think I've seen people baton twirling with this. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. You're right. Well, thanks for bringing those. It's kind of fun. And the fact is, you do a lot of, is the right term, reenactments of things out there? That's right. We have a, a cadre of tour guides who work seven days a week there between May and October. We guide uh, tens of thousands of school kids through, lots of international visitors. We have brochures in 22 languages. We're so close to the airport that everybody stops there, and the guides are wearing costumes like that. At least some of them are. That's great. So. We're going to talk about some of the planning you're doing and some of the very contemporary efforts sure. that you're underway with now, too. But Ann Calvert, um, the Minneapolis Riverfront, mm -hmm. certainly a historic spot just in itself. Could you describe for our viewers um, sort of the, the geographical scope of what you're charged with? The area that we've been working on initially is what we call the Minneapolis Riverfront District, and it's basically both sides of the river from Plymouth Avenue North, which is the same as 8th Avenue Northeast, to 35W, and from about Washington Avenue to University Avenue, and including Nicollet Island in the middle. Okay, so, so it's right next to downtown. Right, right, and, and obviously historic stretch and densely programmed with all kinds of stuff in there. Yes, it is in fact the birthplace of Minneapolis. It centers on St. Anthony Falls, and Minneapolis is where it is because of the water power that was derived from St. Anthony Falls, as, as Stephen pointed out. Back when this area was settled, there was a very different set of factors driving the decisions on where to, to right. um, settle, and the, the power of St. Anthony Falls was very important. So it was the birthplace of the city of Minneapolis, and by the time after the um, World War II, while we had been the milling capital of the world for 50 years from 1880 to 1930, our economy had diversified and the riverfront was very much underutilized. And so a partnership of public and private parties have been working basically for about 30 years now to turn that area around. And I think it's now to the point where people are really realizing what a wonderful gem we have right in the middle of, of downtown. And anybody that's been paying attention for at least the last generation will have seen tremendous changes down there. It's, imp it's impressive. Tremendous changes. We yeah. have um, in areas where before you couldn't even get to, it was full of railroad yards and abandoned industrial buildings. Now there are parks and trails and parkways that connect into Minneapolis' famed parkway system. We have a lot of other amenities, excursion mm -hmm. boats and, and Theater de la Jeune Lune, the Guthrie Theater under mm -hmm. construction. Um, historic preservation has been a very important component of this goal because it is the birthplace of the city. So we want to 
preserve and interpret the history of the area. We've found new uses for over 60 buildings, and we have the St. Anthony Falls Heritage Trail has been completed, and you can do a self-guided tour around that. And then, of course, there's been a lot of publicity about the Mill City Museum. Yeah, which just opened this fall. This mm -hmm. past this fall, right. yeah. And um, we're also creating a brand new community. We have over 3,000 housing units that are either completed or under construction, and hundreds, if not thousands, more in the planning stage, along with other compatible recreational and entertainment sort of uses. So got three theater coming in. Got three theater is now yeah. under construction, and it it really is turning around an area that once was the vital heartbeat of the city, but a very industrial kind of gritty heartbeat. We are now building upon that history and rooted in that history, but we are now building another heartbeat back into the city. Um, taking Another embrace. Another embrace of this yeah. area that, that takes advantage of the fact that it's one of the world's great rivers. And it's a very important historic district, not only for the city of Minneapolis, but for the old, whole upper Midwest, because it was the products from the upper Midwest that were milled first in the sawmilling and then the, the flour milling that were milled at this area and really drove a lot of the development of the Upper you, Midwest. I'm glad you pointed that out because the sawmilling was significant as well. People, mm -hmm. I think, tend to think of the flour if they're not well educated, yes. mm -hmm. but tremendous uh, milling as well uh, uh, of both types. Yes, that was the yeah. initial industry. Lots of partners down there. You and I sometimes have chuckled about this. I mean, there's the city of Minneapolis. People say, well, it's the riverfront in Minneapolis, but that's not where it stops. No, because the, the wonderful thing about that stretch of the Mississippi River is it's significant in so many different ways and has so many different designation, designations that we have all of the local entities and agencies and departments. We have uh, regional partners with the Metropolitan Council at the state level. We have the Historical Society and MnDOT and the DNR. At federal level, we have the Corps of Engineers operating the locks. And the whole stretch of the river through the Twin Cities is a unit of the National Park Service, so they're involved. So one of the, the int most in interesting things but most challenging things about the riverfront is the partnerships that are evolving to complete specific projects, but it also is its own challenge to pull together the appropriate partnership and get everybody comfortable with the direction a project can move and then keeping it coordinated as it goes through. I think just scheduling meetings must be it daunting. Be a big challenge, <laughs> big challenge. And of course the river from there goes right down to the Minnesota River where you are. Is there an, an active military use? There still is some active military. It's primarily Reserve and National mm -hmm. Guard, but the 88th Regional Support Command is headquartered at Fort Snelling and they oversee uh, reserve operations in I think six different states. Uh, many hundreds of units report there, and, and actually during World War II, Fort Snelling inducted 300,000 young men into service who came to the fort for a few days and went wow. elsewhere. And during the recent Middle Eastern War, a lot of reserve, reserve units came to Fort Snelling, processed there in exactly the same way, and then were deployed overseas. So really right up to this, still, this minute then. It's still the same. It's interesting talking about sawmills and uh, Grist mills, the first mills built at the mm -hmm. falls, of course, were built by the Army. They also recognized well, the I didn't know that. and mm -hmm. the resource that was available up there, and part of the military reservation included that area up there. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. well, Stephen, um, what are some of the earlier efforts that went on at Fort Snelling uh, to preserve it? I mean, this is an old it's, site. It's, it's interesting. I, I've been studying Fort Snelling's role in the Civil War recently, and in 1863 there was an editorial in the newspaper calling for preservation of the site. In 1863, <laughs> in 1895, there was another big call for preservation. It said if, if the people of the state want to preserve the fort, they have to make haste because in the War Department there's neither romance nor sympathy. And they'll <laughs> knock everything down. Could you say that again more slowly? <laughs> neither romance nor... In the War Department there is neither romance nor sympathy. Amazing. And it said if the people of Minnesota want to build a historic site here, there'd be nothing like it in the nation. And another uh, unique of course, opportunity. that went unheeded for another 75, 80 years. In the 1960s, the Minnesota Historical Society looked at uh, restoring the old fort. It was pretty much fully restored and reconstructed by the mid-70s as the state's bicentennial project. And now we're looking at a re-restoration of the fort for the state's sesquicentennial coming up. You know, okay, I know you're involved in a, in a master planning process. Is that part of what you're talking that's about? That's part of this, and the mm -hmm. timing is just about right. Uh, 2008 is when we're looking at celebrating the state's 150th anniversary, and that is when we hope to have all of the work done at Historic Fort Snelling and to be able to reopen uh, to a new, a new generation of Minnesotans coming through. Right. And that's going to involve a lot of different things. Well, we were talking with Ann a little bit about some of the partners necessary to get anything going on the Minneapolis Central <coughs> Riverfront. I know that, uh, and I don't know if it's your office, but certainly the fort is in partnership with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board about something that will allow a lot of people well, to come over there. Many, many things going on yeah. at the fort. There's uh, 
Of course, the old polo grounds have been converted into uh, baseball and soccer and softball fields right now. Mm -hmm. Those just opened last summer. There's a new extreme sports facility going in there. There's a tennis center out of the fort. And we're looking at our 25 acres right along the edge of the bluff being redeveloped as well in the next few years to take advantage of those crowds that are already starting to move into the area and recognizing that partners are really going to be the way that sites like ours run in the future. Well, and you and I have talked very briefly about the need maybe to try some new ways to uh, sustain these things. What, what, what kind of things do you have in mind? Well, we have some buildings that we, quite frankly, don't have a use for. We have an old cavalry horse stables. We have two huge old cavalry barracks. Uh, they would be a nightmare to try to heat and light uh, just simply to have museum galleries or storage in, so we're looking at ways to use those. Now people come to our historic site, it takes three, four, five hours to go through, and they get hungry. We have no place for them to eat. Ah. Why not turn that stables into a restaurant? It's right at the far edge of our property, it's fully visible from the highway, it's got great parking right around it, and the idea of putting a restaurant in there to serve our visitors, but also to serve the thousands of people who work around the fort mm -hmm. and the tens of thousands who drive by there every day it makes a lot of sense. So you're talking about driving a little earned income into the project there. Correct, and that earned income then helps support the historical activities going down at the old fort and the restoration of the buildings. Sounds interesting. Same with the barracks. We've got these barracks. Uh, it would be a huge expense to restore them to turn them into a good use, and then to, to pay for that heating and lighting in those buildings. So a private partner coming in, making use of that, perhaps as a hotel, perhaps as interpretive centers, retail, we're not sure, is one way that we could ensure the preservation of those buildings, preserve the outside appearance, put the old porches back on that were there mm -hmm. historically. People would look at them in awe, and inside there'd be a, a modern, useful activity that would help the experience of visitors coming through the site. Sounds like a nice new way to look at some things. It's the only way. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way it's going to happen. It's the only way. Well, in the end, there, there's a lot going on on the riverfront now that just the average person who might be watching the show could come down and see. Could you just talk about some of your favorite things that you encounter down there yourselves or things you might want to highlight for people to think about? Well, certainly one of the more recent projects is the opening of the Mill City Museum. And I think mm -hmm. that's a wonderful place for people to start to get grounded in the history of the area gather some information and then go out and walk the Heritage Trail and yeah. explore whatever. Some people are interested in the architecture, some are more interested in, in the recreational aspects of the area, but the Heritage Trail will lead you around a loop that will allow you to explore a lot of things. And I think another key spot for people to visit is, is the Stone Arch Bridge because it's something so powerful about standing on that beautiful structure mm -hmm. right in the middle of the river and whether it's in the spring when the water is high and the, the mist is coming off the falls and I've heard it tell, told that uh, the mist from the falls will keep you young so that's a good thing oh, really? to go down there. Yes. Um, or I better start showing up. <laughs> standing on the bridge uh, you yeah. know, for fireworks on yeah. 4th of July or um, just standing there at any time of the year and appreciating the, the landscape and the history around mm -hmm. you is a great place to kind of soak up the area. Well I know some efforts are also going on in the upper river as well. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that are just facing your work or these other partners right now? What, what do you most hope to accomplish down there? What, what needs most to be done? Is it all about money? Is it just pulling the people together? It's, it's some of all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, we are not quite done with the Central Riverfronts. We have mm -hmm. some key projects that we still want to complete down there, but I, I think we are definitely comfortable enough with the fact that these projects can be done, we are launching into the Upper River and we have a good start up there mm -hmm. with the rehabilitation of the Grain Belt Brew House for offices and the conversion of part of the Grain Belt property for the Parabotano Branch Library and there's some housing projects underway. So um, it's moving along, but it's always a challenge to find the financial resources and it's even <coughs> more of a challenge these days with the tough straits financially yeah. that many of the governmental agencies are, are under. Yeah. Um, but we're going to keep I think it's a story of persistence. I've told many people, is do not get into this work if you're impatient. It is very much work for people who are patient and persistent. But I think we'll continue to make progress and finish up the Central Riverfront. Although I think it'll continue to be an area that evolves and never is completely static and done and make good progress on the Upper River. Well, knowing your um, persistence and your uh, commitment, th people like yourself are going to make it happen. I understand that. Historic. Okay. Perseverance, I think, is a, a theme yes. we could talk mm -hmm. about here. So, yes. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Nice to learn a little bit more. Thank Stephen, you. nice to have you here. Um, in a moment, we're going to meet uh, Bob Roscoe, talk about residential preservation. But first, we'd like to set up a little image and ask you the question if you know where the heck this is. 
We'll give you the answer later in the show. Stay tuned. Now, in case you really don't know anything about that building, we will identify it for you at the end of the show, so stay tuned. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Bob Roscoe. Bob has a firm called Design for Preservation, and you specialize in a certain kind of preservation. Generally related to historic preservation, the residential um, houses, um, even warehouse con condominium conversions. So. so almost anywhere that someone might reside. Right. Even though they may, there may not have been uh, residents there earlier, so in other words, a reuse. Right. Yeah. Okay. Reuse is the key to a lot of older buildings. Um, uh, as we know, the Grain Belt uh, Brewery Complex, there's no brewing other than great creative ideas happening <laughs> right now. That's a good way to put it. But, uh, yeah. but reuse is always part of it. Different. Yeah, and that's really the key, because if you can't find a reuse for it, uh, it at best, it's probably going to sit there vacant and boarded. <clears throat> Phil, I don't believe in architectural taxidermy. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Uh, in terms of preservation as a field, um, can you give us a little background here in the in the Twin Cities? We were talking with Ann Calvert earlier about the Minneapolis Riverfront, and properly identify Minneapolis as sort of an industrial city back then and in that location. But that's just one half of the story. The other half of the story, uh, as you're right, Phil, the uh, the Riverfront was a birthplace of Minneapolis, and it was an industrial citadel to milling and related industries. But the other part of that is that the workers who worked in those mills went home someplace after work, and they went home to uh, some of the uh, houses and outlying parts of the city that I suppose seemed like suburbs then, but uh, they were single family and duplex neighborhoods, and when the uh, workers came home, they had stories to tell. Just like historic preservation, there's story after story that tells us about our city's history. Well, well, and thinking of downtown, of course, I remember seeing images of where the the, the uh, city courthouse still stands. Right. There were individual homes, there single were. family homes, right. right cheek by jowl there. Mm -hmm. But also here in Northeast, and we've got an image that I think is fascinating, and you know about this site, the Stonehouse Apartments. Right. You said that was an early effort. That was early in the uh, historic preservation movement efforts. It really happened without the mechanics of the preservation movement that we know it today. And it's kind of, kind of how Minneapolis can really work well. Somebody decided this, this building is really important. Uh, it was a building for uh, elderly and little sisters of the poor, I think, were there. And uh, Ori has converted to that use. And uh, it's an example of vernacular architecture where it's the form of the building, the simple forms like roofs, arrangements of windows, the rhythms they form, without a lot of, of uh, decorative elements hung on the side of the building. But it's, it's very important and it's a very pleasing building to drive by and, and that building can, you know, is a good example of making buildings survive for new uses. And it's there to this date. Right. Yep. So people really can. You have to see show, stay till the end and then get out and go up to northeast Minneapolis and check out that building. It's a beautiful building. Yeah. Right. And speaking of the way that you say that happened really before there was a self-conscious movement and, right. and you can help us educate us a little bit about how times change in terms of what it is people want to do to preserve buildings. You mentioned that in the 70s, really there was one approach to taking care of a building, well, it a was, residential type building. Right. It was almost, uh, the 70s was a period of uh, a counterculture era where everybody had different creative ideas, but a lot of those creative ideas really formed an orthodoxy uh, when it came right down to it. Uh, all the hippies really dressed alike when it came right down to it, but uh, that aside, um, with the Milwaukee Avenue a Historic District in South Minneapolis that I was involved in, I became the project architect working for the Seward West Project Area Committee that uh, attempted successfully to save that from a public agency uh, demolition and it became a historic district. But the 70s was an era where people thought we can do anything and it's it's a great time when, when individuals uh, really thought they could change the world. So when it came to, to these houses on Milwaukee Avenue in the surrounding areas in Seward neighborhood, um, they uh, would back up a dumpster to these houses and out would go the lath and plaster. Wow. And the interior was really remade the way yeah. these people wanted it. But they keep the shell. They keep the shell, right. Yeah. But the interiors were brand spanking new. Wow. Now, uh, 
t today, uh, well, I went to a, a Christmas party at a house in uh, Uppertown, St. Paul, near West 7th, uh, a couple years ago. And Uppertown is the sewer to west of the 90s. But there's a new affordability and a new consciousness towards preservation. Uh, people are spending more time thinking of preservation inside and out. So you still saw the original plaster on these walls. The original woodwork, banged up though it might be, mm -hmm. was still there, carefully varnished, and... Uh, is, is it more costly though to kind of try and preserve that sort of in place, or the, does it actually save money The by whole doing point that? is, you're, you're right, Phil, it, yeah. it really was cheaper because they took their time at it and, and, uh, and just lived with what's there. Right. And, and that's that's great. No, I, I said that despite, I just told you a little while ago, didn't I, that I don't believe in architectural taxidermy, but... Well, to anyways, an extent, right, right. yeah. And that's the sort of thing that you and I assume other professional uh, preservationists can come in and help a given homeowner do? Right. Mm -hmm. And am I right that St. Paul has a program of support for this sort of thing, or is it pretty much neighborhood by neighborhood? Who gets uh, behind that? There's an organization, uh, Historic St. Paul, that's a nonprofit, community-based organization mm -hmm. that... Uh, gets funding from various sources with fundraising and they provide a loan uh, programs to people who live in target areas, mostly east side, uh, Dayton's Bluff area and Payne Phelan. Um, and houses are selected for their architectural potential and uh, that need a lot of uh, updating from, from the unwise uh, remodelings and modernizations that happened sure. in the 50s and 60s. So. Uh, my job is to provide the uh, architecture uh, treatments and drawings and so on to to uh, bring these houses back to the original character. It's you a great program. You mentioned Milwaukee Avenue back in South Minneapolis, right. in the Seward neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Named after what, the Milwaukee Road? Was that not also a railroad uh, it, it was. community, a kind of a bedroom community? Right, the uh, Milwaukee Railroad had a huge railroad yards just about um, a block south of where the end of Milwaukee Avenue is. Milwaukee Avenue starts at Franklin, it's, it's just south of Augsburg College, mm -hmm. starts at Franklin, ends at uh, East 24th Street, and then just a couple of blocks beyond that was the railroad yards. Before we go too much further, I want to point out to our viewers that you've taken this passion for preservation, personal and professional, and you are now an art photographer, Right. and you use, I, just, I guess I'll say images and elements of some buildings in your art. We're going to bring an image or two up. Could you talk a little bit about what keyed you to do this and what, what it is you're out there capturing? I wish I could tell you, yeah. Phil. Um, I've just developed an interest in photography and it sort of snuck parallel alongside my architectural interests and professional mm -hmm. interests dealing with older buildings. And I've seen so many older buildings that have survived um, sometimes very inelegantly with unwise additions that were done uh, or human indifference or weather and time but sometimes those form interesting compositions, the textures and the interruption by uh, a piece of plywood boarding, boarding up a window or, um, or when the buildings get a new different use. Uh, some cases buildings for a long time settle for less. Like uh, when I was in Vermont and Burlington I saw this old building that had been uh, a factory for, for producing structural iron and now it's storing salt. <laughs> oh, in the windows, very interesting reuse there. Yeah, yeah, the windows are boarded up and uh, the windows are cracked and so one of my images kind of shows artfully, I, I hope, that. Well, I particularly like the almost abstract quality of it. I mean, right. first I get a, a set of color fields and then as I kind of key in a little bit more, and at least in the images of yours that I've seen, I can start picking out some of the details and it really does inform me about some of the things that you care about well, thank in you, your Phil. other work. Thank you. That's pretty yeah, good. That's, that's the intention here. Sure. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges to preserving either a given house or a neighborhood or a cluster of homes? What, 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 do you, what are you up against? Well, it's sort of what Stephen said earlier here that uh, he mentioned in, in uh, 1898 that the, uh, uh, the saying that the army didn't, wasn't, uh, didn't show uh, uh, sympathy nor romance towards its past. Right. It wasn't really their mission. It wasn't their mission. Right. And strangely enough, you know, the army really reflects life in general. Uh, those of us that have been in the army would deny that. But, uh, but I, I think that, that Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, there still is a lingering element that this is still a prairie. You can uh, bust new sod and then plant, grow it, walk away from it, 
chop down more trees. Mm -hmm. That feeling is, is still lingering. Uh, the, the inertia of that is still there, despite the fact that we've also grown a culture in the upper Midwest uh, of people who really respect the past. They, they find that uh, hist history provides not a way of just only looking backward. History is a pattern for the future. And uh, so there's that, there's that residual element of um, this is old stuff, tear it out. And the other, this is something that, that we can form. This is an opportunity for us to form yep. new lives. New lives and, and new economic development, for and, that matter. And new stories. And new stories. Right. Bob Roscoe, we're just out of time. Thank you very much for sharing some of your background okay. about this topic. I'm glad to come. Pleased to have you okay. here. Well, we'll be back with a guest to talk about what RSP Architects has done with the great Grain Belt Brewery in Northeast Minneapolis. But first, let's hear about Team 007. Stay tuned. I'm Charlene Royce, and I'm president of Hess Royce & Company. We're an historical consulting firm, and we do work all over the country related to the National Register of Historic Places and uh, lots of other things related to history. We mostly do research. Team 007, we, uh, a group of us in Minneapolis, when we found out that the National Trust was coming here, decided we wanted to use this as an opportunity to really propel preservation in Minneapolis. And so a, a little ad hoc group of kind of guerrilla preservationists have been getting together every month and for the last seven months or so and just talking about what things we would like to see happening by 2007. And we're partly directing this at the Trust Conference as a goal, but we're also just doing this because we want to move preservation issues in Minneapolis. We'd like to get some walking tours organized. We'd like to get some publications out. There are some good publications out there, but a lot of them are outdated. We want to get those revised. Um, we'd like to get perhaps some statewide tax credits for uh, historic preservation projects. That's a big one. But, uh, <laughs> and, and we're working both within our group and also with uh, people in St. Paul, too, and from out state. The National Trust for Historic Preservation is a membership organization, so anybody can belong has about uh, 250,000 members. It's based in Washington, D.C. And people in, who are members range from professionals like me uh, to just people who like old buildings. Some of the projects that we'd like to get going specifically are getting some more properties listed in the National Register of Historic Places. One of my personal interests is properties from the post-World War II period. And I think perhaps an urban renewal historic district, it's, uh, it's time for that now. We need to look at the downtown area that was very much renovated in the 1960s and 70s. Cedar Riverside and those high rises over there that people love to hate. There are lots of interesting things that happened in the post-war period. They're now getting to be 50 years old and qualifying for the National Register in some cases. So it's, it's time to start looking at those. Uh, Team 007 has also talked about doing an education initiative. We would like to get kids in the schools more involved in preservation and there is a curriculum in St. Paul in the third grade. We'd like to get like something like that over here. Uh, historic plaques. Uh, when people walk by an historic building, wouldn't it be nice if there was a unified plaque program so people knew that this was an historic building and knew why. The National Trust for Historic Preservation is having their annual conference here in 2007, which seems like a long time from now, but it'll be here before we know it. The website, if I can put in that, is www.nthp.org. Thanks. Well, we thank Charlene. Uh, she and her team actually were what uh, first pitched the idea to us to do a show all about historic preservation. So thanks, Team 007. My next guest is Jam Jeremy Mayberg. He's a principal with RSP Architects. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's nice to be here, Phil. You also wear a number of other hats. I first met you in the context of the Northeast Minneapolis Arts Association, right. of which you're on the board. Mm -hmm. That's right. And in just doing a little research on you, I know that part of your professional background is, uh, includes projects with the expansion of the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and on that same campus, Children's Theater. That's correct. So you're making a great contribution to our cultural life here in the Twin Cities. It's fun to be a part of those projects. And I'm just going to ask you this. This whole conversation really is about the Grain Belt Brewery, and just as someone who goes there, what, almost every day of your life, how do you like working there? It's incredible. I still pinch myself every morning when I come in the door. Yeah, it's yeah, just it's, it's a gorgeous yeah. building to look at, and you get to go in there and work. Every day. Now, uh, we'll go into some details later, but just as, as a lot of folks will know that building, what part of the building are you in? Me personally? Yeah, you personally. Or, uh, I sit in what was the um, warehouse area of the brewery okay. um, where um, I think basically the fermenting occurred. <laughs> I'm on the first floor in the back of the building. Okay. Yeah. And there, there, was a, there was just a lot of vital activity going on in that building and fermentation. I think yeah. your firm still is doing that in a way. I guess. Tell us a little bit about RSP Architects. You're the tenant there. You've got a long-term lease we there. Are. What 
propelled you to this historic and difficult site? Well, we've always been housed in historic buildings. Our first um, location was the Wesley Temple Building um, in 1978 when the firm was formed. Uh, we moved to 121st Avenue North, which also was on the historic register, um, and uh, quickly outgrew that space, and eventually we were in three buildings in the warehouse district, also all in historic buildings. And uh, in 1999, we felt the need to kind of come back under one roof. Um, we hired Russ Nelson of Nelson Teets Hoy to help us look for space, and he brought up the idea, he asked Dave Norbeck, president of our company, had we ever considered the Grand Bell Brewery, and of course we hadn't. I mean, who had? Right. Uh, a number of people well, had. Well, there'd and been there'd a theater been, idea, uh, and, uh, a the whole Guthrie raft and, of, of yeah. uh, aborted efforts or unsuccessful right. efforts. Uh, I know there was a sound stage and an right. aquarium, and um, but the stars aligned, I guess, and um, we toured the building, and we were seduced by its beauty, its potential beauty, and the awesome nature of the building, and the capability uh, or the potential for it to be our house and clearly there was enough space and that's one of the things we were looking for was space. Um, so uh, RSP architects, Ryan um, companies who, be, who were the developers and became our landlord, um, uh, the city of Minneapolis through MCDA, a number of, uh, of historical preservation agencies in both the state and the city all came together on what became a long involved and complicated journey to convert the um, the brew house to right. um, to our offices. Well, and the classic building is actually a mix of architectural styles. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm mm -hmm. not educated mm -hmm. enough to articulate all those, but can you mm -hmm. just tell us why was such a building built that way? Well, it was built uh, in 1910 for the what what became the Minneapolis Brewery. Uh, it was actually four brew houses or breweries that were under one roof. Um, it's one of the, I, I believe, five remaining uh, Victorian um, breweries still around. Um, clearly you mean on a national level? On a national basis. Wow. One of the largest and most um, ornate of, of them. And it was designed to look like four different buildings or three different buildings. So that was purposeful. It purposeful. wasn't simply addition. That is correct. And another interesting piece in which played into our ability to, to, uh, to, to be, uh, eventually become uh, tenants in the building was there were, while it was designed as a, as a warehouse function, uh, <clears throat> the architect who designed it didn't want to build just a big monolithic block. So they, they designed in implied windows. That is, there were brick arches put in, although there were no windows put in there, uh, in, a, in a, a wide uh, variety of areas in the building. The, um, when it came time for us to look at renovating it, we had to work with the um, Historical Preservation Commission to get approval to take those implied windows out and make them into real windows. The, the uh, commission allowed us to put windows anywhere where there was an implied window. We couldn't cut a new hole in a building. If we were not able to do that, we wouldn't have been able to, to move into the building. Right, because there wouldn't have been work, enough light. Yeah, your work requires yeah, absolutely. a certain amount of light. Absolutely. But it sounds like a nice partnership yeah. there with their needs and requirements and, and your needs. Yeah, and and if you want to talk about challenges, I think uh, the, the most significant challenge in, in, in making that building a reality was um, pulling together all the various uh, kind of uh, uh, agendas that that came to be. There was the um, there was the historical preservation. There was uh, hazardous materials in the building. There was obviously building code compliance for sure. life safety. There was zoning compliance. There was the economics of the issue. Yeah. There was the MCDA requirements. There were neighborhood requirements, <laughs> and it goes on and on and on, as you might imagine. Well, I was going to mention that I couldn't <laughs> think of a better potential tenant to go in and see right. the potential for the space than an architectural firm. But also, it's in the nature yeah. of what you yeah. do to sort of knit together these various interests and parties, yeah. and I, I don't know if anyone else could have gone in there and done You mentioned challenges in the building, though. It certainly has to include things like, I think you mentioned asbestos, there was mm -hmm. mold, there were uneven mm -hmm. floor plates, mm -hmm. there were huge, what, uh, multi-story holes where the silos of the mm -hmm. grain search. Mm -hmm. How did you all, I mean, you're architects, so I know mm -hmm. there's an answer yeah. to this, but mm -hmm. was that not daunting? Well, it was difficult, yeah. uh, daunting and challenging. I'm, I, I was not on the actual design team, and I'm grateful. Uh, <laughs> if you can imagine doing the design for mm -hmm. an architectural office of 200 people, each having their own uh, idea of what that space should look like. So uh, it, it was definitely challenging, both internally and, and externally. Uh, but it, it's clear that there was, from the very beginning, an idea that this would be a great space. Yeah. And uh, we, there weren't many opportunities like this were going to come along. 
and we had to jump on it when it came along. Um, uh, Russ Nelson once said that we, we were like the dog that chased the car and caught it. Um, it's just such a, an amazing uh, opportunity and such a big opportunity, but uh, in the end, such a rewarding opportunity. I think I saw a quote by Linda Mack, columnist for the Star Tribune, who said that you folks, along with Ryan, mm -hmm. uh, let, I think she said, let a historic building live. Any comments on that? Absolutely. Um, it took, we spent about four months gutting it um, and getting it down to zero. Yeah. Um, one of the difficulties of the um, hazardous material, especially the mold, was we had to, re the, one of the downsides was we had to remove a lot of plaster. Yeah. One of the upsides was we had to remove a lot of plaster because <laughs> underneath that plaster was magnificent stonework. Yeah. Um, there's stone markings by uh, masons that were left there intact because they were covered. We were able to uncover them as like an archaeological piece. Um, there's magnificent brickwork. There's a very, just an interesting way in which the stone was put together. Um, the, the exterior of the building, the stone is very well detailed. On the inside, it looks like an old Minnesota barn basement. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a certain kind of uh, archaeological an anthropological characteristic to it, which is which is very cool, um, and that's just a great place to to, to work in. And uh, I, my office has this immense old stone wall, and I feel like I'm working in a place that um, I can I can I can literally reach out and touch the wall and and rub it. Some of it comes off, which yeah. is a, which is part of a problem. But but history's right there with all mm. of us, and, and history's a big part of what we do. Let's talk, so, let's talk briefly about uh, the connection to community. Now, you sure. mentioned Dave Norback, sure. who happened to grow up in Northeast Minneapolis. That's correct. And you folks also uh, helped uh, redo, or well, bring over the Bontano Library there. That's correct. Right. So, what does it mean for you all to be in a neighborhood and not? in say a downtown setting. There is a well, connection to community. It is, it's a great opportunity. Yeah. And uh, the Bodno Library is a wonderful story. Um, the, uh, the community actually brought that to life. There were, the uh, Bodno Library was existing in a storefront um, over on 12th at about 2,000 square feet. It was woefully under, underutilized, overutilized I guess. Way little, way, way too many books, way too little space and lines out the door waiting to get in and use it and there was a need. Um, the building was available. Um, there was a time when the, the library were expanding and they, they really wanted that building to be renovated. We actually competed for that job. We didn't get it just wasn't because it was part of the package nope. deal. Uh, but we were very happy to have had the opportunity and, and the beauty of it is that it brings to life that much more what was the grain belt compound. If you walk that site, any building that's in yellow brick is on the historic register. So it either has to be renovated or it's going to have to just disintegrate. And yeah. the Grain Belt Brewery was disintegrating and, and unless it was repaired, the whole North River Corridor and much of North East Minneapolis was at risk of not having the opportunity mm -hmm. to become uh, revitalized. The same with the, uh, the, the library. The library actually is part of the old um, wagon shed and Wainwright studio and we were able to reclaim big parts of that. We used some of the brick that was taken off the Grain Belt Brewery to restore some of the sure. walls in the library. And in the end, what we have is a, is a, is a wonderful um, area within the neighborhood that brings life back. There's a, uh, uh, scores of people come through the building and say, I, I remember being here when I was a kid. I remember when my dad worked here. I remember coming by here and going through the tour. Well, not long before the brewery closed down, I used to go there and get the water to go home and make my home brew. There you go. So there I've been watered go. and nurtured yeah. by that yeah. as well. Yeah. We have just a moment left. Sure. Um, you, I know that your firm has uh, allowed the community to come in. You had some uh, for a third thurs Thursday yes, tours. Yes, that's correct. Does that, is that still continuing? I believe it is. That's great. So if uh, people wanted, they could get involved. At three o'clock. Three o'clock on the third Thursday on the of the third month. Third Thursday, that's correct. You Show have to sign up. Sign up. Oh, yeah. Yep. I would assume yep. it's a guided tour. It is a guided tour. That's right. Yeah, we have a whole raft of folks who are, who can give tours of the building and enjoy it. It's a, it's a treat to take people through. Anybody I've met that's involved with your firm and working in that space is passionate about it, as you are. Well, thank you, Jeremy. It's been nice to have you on Mine the show. Mine too. Thank you. Well, we'll be back to close up the show in just a moment, but first we are now going to answer that question about what was that building in Northeast that we showed you an image of a little bit ago. So stay tuned. Minneapolis City Hall has been the home for the Committee on Urban Environment for the past 35 years. Due to major budget cuts, departmental reorganization, and other political agendas, by the end of this year, Q may be homeless. 
Q and its 27 members is asking the serious question, where may we want to transition to? Do we want to transition to another department within the city? Do we want to be outside the city? Do we want to be totally autonomous? These are the questions that are being asked by these members. They are critical things. We wish to preserve the unique and good works that have been happening for these past 35 years. And we hope by the end of the year, we will be with a fresh face in a new home, perhaps in City Hall. If you wish to support these good efforts of Q, contact the Friends of Q. Well, thank you, Meg. It's important to stay aware of what's going on with Q. They are, after all, our sponsor for On Q. And having said that, we may be on Q in limbo for the next few months. At the end of the show, we're running a great photo of some young people in Northeast Neighborhood House, so stay tuned, watch those credits. And until we see you again, I'm Phil Lindsay. It's great to be here. Mm -hmm.